Hi guys, welcome to another episode of the Coffee Conversation part by the Emerging India Forum TIFF and our technology partner Prime Infotech Solution. Today's theme is Empowering Through Compliance, a conversation with the expert under the Sri Shakti series. I am Jolly Singh, co-host at Coffee Conversation and associate with Prime Infotech Solution. And today we have with us Preeti Sikdar, having over 25 years of experience in risk management, information security audits, internal audit and compliance audits. She is an international author with two books, Practitioner's Guide to Business Impact Analysis and a Strong Security Governance Through Integration and Automation. She has also been adjudged among the top 15 global top talent professionals by BCMI. Today, she has graced us with her presence to share insights from her illustrious career and offer inspiration to aspiring professionals in the industry. A very warm welcome to you, ma'am. Thank you. Um, ma'am, our today's conversation is divided in three parts. Uh, with the first round is the professional questions. The second round is the personal questions where we like to know you, uh, prefer knowing you, as a person apart from your career and then we uh, round up the entire conversation with a very fun rapid fire round so let's get started with the very first round which is the professional questions round and my very first question to you would be uh, that with your extensive experience in risk management and compliance how do you approach identifying and mitigating potential risks for your client yeah good question uh, the problem is that we wouldn't have industry, we wouldn't have business without risk, right? So risk is everywhere. Threat is everywhere. And uh, as far as clients are concerned now, more and more, uh, the regulators are also, uh, you know, uh, urging them to go into risk management. So basically what the earlier uh, businessmen used to do by thumb rule. Now we have got uh, disciplines to uh, see and basically how is risk defined it's a outcome of uncertainty on objectives and what objectives the objectives of the business objectives of the business so when i approach the client and every and i i define myself personally risk as something very personal see the way we treat personal person in, in even your personal life uh, do we pull the lock twice before we leave no do we see to it that it is locked? So security risk and risk taking is a personal matter. So whoever is doing risk assessment, suppose you and I do the same risk assessment, yet there would be differences. So for each client, you know, getting them on the same page, I, I would take them into a workshop mode so that they themselves from the horse's mouth, they can identify the risk that they are facing. The power past precedence that has happened in security because risk is not standalone. It is a part of your uh, the business, a part of your, uh, you know, business continuity drive, everything. So um, you have, they have to identify the risk because hurricane is not common to India, but hurricane is a threat. So what is a threat and what culminates into a risk? That should be very well defined. And that's why I always take a workshop and a, awareness campaign before I start. I see to it that, you know, it is done. And then there are various uh, ways of uh, attacking risk, qualitative, quantitative, that is a different matter. That is, uh, uh, let's not go into that. But first of all, identification of risk is important. Just as important as a doctor is diagnosing the illness. Unless he diagnoses, he cannot treat. So unless you diagnose the risk, you cannot treat risk, right? Absolutely right, ma'am. Uh, can you like share a very any particular uh, challenging project uh, which uh, crosses your mind, which you have worked on, and how you exactly overcame obstacles to deliver successful outcomes? <laughs> so I was doing a compliance project on SOC two uh, for a multi-country and multi-location uh, this thing. Okay, now there were various problems. The client was very tough. And as always, and uh, the, they had very, very deadlines, which were uh, this. And unfortunately, I had a team of people 
who were doing first time with me. So I, I had to give them classroom coaching and strict discipline we had to work. That is all fine, you know, that happens many a times. But the worst thing which happened was that we was interviewing one of the countries in the South America. We realized that they could not understand English. And the person who was mediating from the client side, he got so angry. Preeti, didn't you anticipate blah, blah, blah. So I said, no problem. So we use the translator uh, app, which is available. And so from here, the question went translated into Spanish. Then it came back, spread, uh, the answer came back, though it was slow, but we could manage to, you know, complete the questionnaire that we wanted to do. And that is how. Secondly, you know, discipline is very necessary. You don't think it's so, so many things you are doing, you may forget. So. That day itself, even the uh, timing is uh, 9 o'clock night, uh, the interview starts and 10 o'clock it ends. Yet, my team was trained that that day itself, they should make a list of evidences so that that day itself, the two uh, cadres of checking would take place. The, um, their senior would check and then it will come to me. I will check and I will email. So the very same day it emailed. So if you follow a discipline, and st strict timelines and strict way of working methodology, then I think that nothing is challenging. Because if there is a problem, there's always a solution. As you saw, there was a translator which we could use, you know. <laughs> so, uh, yes, ma'am. Like, as rightly said, everything has a is solution. easy and nothing is difficult. That's what my father-in-law always used to say. Nothing is easy and nothing is difficult. Your approach should be proper absolutely ma'am uh, ma'am as someone certified in cisa cism uh, crisc uh, iso 272001 la and likes all the courses how do you keep up with the evolving landscape of information security and compliance standards these are just tail end i can say which adds to my profile the real thing is you have, if you are in compliance, then you have to be online real time. You have to uh, study the latest. Like now the uh, Privacy Act has come. A few years back, GDPR came. So you can't say I'm CISA qualified, so I'm qualified to do it. No, you have to study what it entails and what are the requirements. Then only you can service the client. Being a CISA qualified does not mean anything. Uh, Ma'am, also like, uh, how do you see uh, being very much updated with the dynamic profession that you are in and the cer the certifications, as you said, that these are just uh, profiles. The, uh, enhancers. Yes, profile <laughs> enhancers. Exactly, ma'am. So like, how do you see it? Like, uh, as someone who should like, what should they focus on? Profile enhancing certifications or like being updated because or they should go hand in hand. What is, what is your approach exactly in this matter? So I have got many mentees all over the world. Okay, because I'm an international author, etc. So I always tell them have a balance of both. One year, one certification take take it because it is a part of your professional uh, uh, CPE, they call it no? the, the professional education. And what happens when you are constantly a learner now, your learning curve never falls down. Your learning curve always remains a, a student's curve. And that is how it, it will reflect in the work you do. You are more amenable, you are more uh, you know, so acceptable to changes and other things. So I should say that continuous evolving and continuous education is important for the youngsters. And I always advise them that enhance your career that way. Absol absolutely, ma'am. Uh, now, what role do you believe business re resilience plays in today's volatile business environment? And how do you assist organizations in building up these business re resilience? Come again. Uh, ma'am, uh, what role do you believe business resilience plays in today's volatile business environment? And what do you... Uh, 
uh, how do you assist organizations in building these business resilience that is needed in the dynamic and volatile business environment that we have in present today? Absolutely. Today, what we call business resilience was called uh, business continuity planning in yesterday years. And tomorrow it will be called something else. But the fact remains that to continue doing business is one of our primary objective. Correct? So uh, what I would say is that uh, uh, if I could give an example, then you see uh, that Hurricane Katrina at that time, uh, it was so severe that the entire electricity went down in the entire US. But there was one small place called St. Tammany's, you know. They had a, a very sophisticated generator. So it's a part of their business continuity endeavor. And it kept their, uh, their uh, building alive and lighted even the lifts throughout the outage time, till such time that the normal electricity was so you see, it is, I, as I told you, it's a personal thing. From organization to organization, they have different risk appetites and they have different ways of treating the uh, threats. Okay. So now this was the way. Then one more is Merrill Lynch. Merrill Lynch uh, business continuity head was there when the WTC incident took place. And you will not believe that business continuity and resilience was so powerful that within one day, they were uh, on uh, recovery mode and within a short period, they were as business as usual. So you see, resilient planning, resilient to be resilient is important. And you can also see that COVID time, those who are internally and inherently strong and they had the resistance power, they did not contract the COVID. But who contracted COVID? That those who were a bit on the weaker side. So, uh, so that itself, the, the happening of COVID is a uh, dangerous uh, bell for us, actually, that now if we neglect uh, planning for business continuity or resilience, then we are going into big, big, big loss. Because uh, empirical evidence says that around 20% of the 80% rather, not only 20% of the uh, industries, they shut down after a major outage. Okay. So you can imagine, you, you cannot underestimate and saying that, oh, this is not important. I consider that business resilience should be woven into the fabric of every organization. Uh could you share insights, ma'am, uh, as in like uh, for your experience in conducting th third party audits, especially in the financial sector and ensuring compliance with regulatory requirements? Yeah. With the financial sector, it is always a regulatory requirement. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. third. Okay. Now we say that what is the third party? He is nothing but your extended arm only. So if you consider third parties who do work for you as an extended family or extended enterprise, then you should know that there is no sense in having all the controls in the world and being resilient if your third party is not resilient. So call it under any name, whether it is NCA compliance or if it is SEBI compliance or anything, you cannot neglect your third party. And I've done a a plenty of audits. We even go there to see whether they are complying with the business continuity. Should anything happen to them, will the, the company suffer or not? Then also we look at third party as a um, you know single dependency, the single point of failure. Where if uh, the third party stops functioning, then the original uh, person who depends on him cannot go to anybody because he doesn't have anybody in the pipeline. So then having redundancies and having, it's a big study, you know, that how to treat single point of failure, how to go and audit into the um, third party audits. And you know very well that the SOC 2 is basically due to that. All the cloud uh, service providers have to submit SOC 2 reports to the 
uh, the clients because and they are publishing on their websites also because uh, third party has become very essential now. Uh uh, Ma'am, you already mentioned that uh, COVID uh, taught us like business resilience. One thing that it also taught us uh, what I feel is uh, remote work and management. So as someone who can operate remotely for offshore engagements, how do you effectively manage remote teams and ensure uh, you know, project success? Right. So uh, there were a few frauds also due to work from home uh, allowances but uh, if we do not consider them uh, we can say we have gone into uh, a new uh, new uh, way of working you know earlier those organizations who did not even allow or think about you know work from home option they also began to see because they could see the benefit that it came in terms of, you know, saving in the rent and, you know, not having to have an establishment and all those things. So the good part of it also, you know, dawned upon the people. And uh, your question was that uh, how you uh, believe in offshore. I said it is very good avenue now for uh, India because um, I remember when the COVID broke out, my tickets were packed for a Australian project. And uh, having packed my bags, everything, then I realized that the uh, thing was called off, travel restrictions came across. So then I was thinking that what to do, how to make the most of the opportunity or leave it. And I suggested the same model as you are suggesting, the offshore model. I said, no, no. I gave the full proposal again to the company. And I did the entire thing offshore because at home I had nothing else to do also. So um, I completed the assignment and I got one more assignment also because they felt that yes, this is a good way and they also saved their money on the ticket and all. So offshoring is a good option. See, when I was in London KPMG, uh, I was heading a project on uh, offshoring offshoring to India and it was between US, KPMG, UK and India and uh, they themselves reap the benefits of getting the processing work done in India. So it, the, the, this, the gap was so wide that they could not just resist and it has continued, the trend has continued. And even today, see, there is nothing wrong in, uh, you know, taking on offshoreable work from abroad. And if onshore, there are people who will be front-ending the client, you know, in my case, a consultancy, then seamlessly the work goes on, unless the country gives you objection in sharing of data. Then you can't do anything. I think offshoring has become a very good option. And uh, a lot of organizations has like gained similar benefits as you are describing here, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, can you discuss your approach to project portfolio management and how do you prioritize tasks to meet the project deadlines? Project portfolio? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> So for me, uh, different projects would be the different assignments that I'm simultaneously working on. And that I used to do in Grand Fountain where I was, uh, I was used to UKPMG London and everywhere. And you will not, uh, there was a time when it reached a mad madness stage where I would be doing an audit in uh, a bank audit in Mumbai and then rushing to Delhi because of some uh, SOX audit and sitting there and discussing the report with the, the CEO uh, in Delhi and then suddenly rushing to uh, Mathura and uh, Agra to just show, uh, guide the team to how to do this, you know, migration audit of the bank as well as, you know, then suddenly the, my partner would call me and say that, uh, you know, I need you very badly in RPJ because, you know, I'm losing the project. Can you come? So this was the madness stage with which, you know, I used to travel and I used to do these type of multitasking jobs. So I think uh, because I have a passion for what I do, 
uh, I could uh, take the stress, you know. Not everybody would be able to, I think, uh, go with it. But for me, my work is my passion. And I'm like, what was your exact strategy to prioritize which uh, to prioritize and navigate through the project deadlines? <laughs> because everybody is in a hurry to uh, complete their project because theirs is the most important in their set of right. minds. So, yeah. So ideally, you should uh, have a um, bi-weekly timetable because beyond that, you can't stick to the timetable. So bi-weekly, if you prepare a timetable, you should know the muta moti where you are supposed to be. But as, if there is an emergency and then if everybody starts banging your head, then you can't do anything straight, right? So uh, delegation, madam, delegation also plays a very important role. So you should know what to keep in your hand and how much to delegate to your juniors, having full faith in what type of capacity they have to deliver. If you can judge that and you have some time to, you know, allocate to that, sometimes I feel that having too much qualified person on the job also backfires because he will not do what you want, but he will use his own head. So sometimes you require a hand rather than a head to work. You got my point? That's that's a very different kind of insight that you just have shared that you just need a hand rather than a brain to work. I've somewhere. gone through such a situation. That's what I'm saying. I got so fed up, you know, then uh, then I, I said, you know, I don't want any qualified person. I want a simple person who would take my orders. Uh, what strategies uh, do you align uh, business requirement with technology solutions to achieve organizational goals? Very good. My second book, a Strong Security Governance Through Automation and Innovation, integration it's a, a classic example see because if you if, if you consider the whole system development life cycle the ma major illness here sometimes is that the business requirements are not properly mapped so it's not whether i am cooking in the kitchen but it, it's what i am cooking and what i am making the menu that is important so I have big, big places in the past, in the past 10 years, I've experienced, you know, once I was told to uh, find out why a new uh, application was not being used by the users. So I said, fine, I went there and I spent some time, half an hour, one hour with them. And I talked to them very free. I said, don't hesitate, tell why you are not using. So they said, Ki, this app has an inherent problem. SEBI requires us to, uh, you know, give our report by seven every day. And this will not, if we use this, this will not allow us so that we will have breach of uh, the condition and then we will face the penalty. So that is the reason we don't use. Then why was this point not taken out during the requirement phase where it was, this is a very crucial point. The timeliness should have been there when at the time of, so, the entire thing went into a loss. I was in a very big company in the UK and they scrapped one application after undergoing at least 60% of the work. Whereas if the steering committee would have taken a call at 25%, they would have scrapped it. Plus more small things, you know, uh, the handling the, the entire system development life cycle, agile, this, that, should suit the requirement of the user. User involvement in SDLC is the major issue. And yes, if you match the requirement, business requirement with technology, you can do much better, much faster. I agree. Uh, and ma'am, how do you describe the impact of technology uses in your career specifically? Sorry? How do you uh, describe the impact of technology usage in your career exactly? It is, uh, I can say in my career uh, would uh, and technology goes parallel to each other. 
because uh, the, even if you see the major compliance uh, solutions that we have, they are all based out of software. And you know, the, 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 the tools to audit, they are also software, ACL, IDEA, all those things. So I feel that technology cannot be removed from our lives at all, whether it is industry or whether it is consultancy or audit or whatever. Uh, what advice would you give uh, to aspiring professionals looking to excel in the fields of risk management and compliance? Right. So uh, there are uh, students who are out of the science stream, IITs, uh, BSc, IIT. For them, you know, technical things are much simpler. So they can go for those type of certifications like CISM and uh, all those where, you know, the technical skills also will be used for compliance. Whereas uh, um, there would be other things like uh, CISA and other where, you know, your auditing skills will be. So auditor skill can be um, can be assumed by anybody. You can adopt auditor skill if you are properly trained. So they uh, and the most important thing is that the person should ask himself or herself that was it, what is it that I have interest in. After you have passed a certain degree of graduation and post graduation. What field it is that is interesting to me? Is it, uh, the forensics? Is it this? And one should go for it. Because I feel that if you work and make a career out of something which you really like to do, you'll make much more successful career woman or career person. Then you do something just for the heck of it. Absolutely, ma'am. And that is it for the professional round questions, ma'am. We are uh, towards towards our next round, which is the personal questions round. And my first question to you would be that outside of work, what are some of the activities or hobbies that you really enjoy to unwind and relax? Right. So if I tell you that uh, I enjoy to... Um, just do nothing. Okay. Sometimes yes, ma'am. That 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 makes sense. Would you believe it? Would you believe? I it? would definitely believe it because now it's so much of work that we enjoy doing nothing. <laughs> so sometimes that is also very important because the good thoughts come to you when you are doing nothing. Creative thoughts come to you, but. Basically, I, I write poems uh, and I, as it is, I am a writer. Yeah. So uh, creativity is uh, very much a part of me. Plus, I like to listen to music. And I, I like to go on a road trip. Okay. Uh, and uh, how do you prioritize spending time with your family and friends amidst your busy, busy professional commitments? I am always free for everybody. That is my motto. Okay. So, uh, I my family is my first priority and has always been throughout my career. Because when my son went to UK to study, I went there and stayed with him for four years and uh, I was working with KPMG. My So, I always feel that Without my family, I am nothing. So I have very strong family uh, emotions. Okay, ma'am. And uh, do you, uh, as you mentioned that you like to travel, so do you have any particular uh, travel experience uh, that left a very lasting impact on you? <laughs> yes, of course. Uh, my entire family, we had gone to Kerala and uh, last minute my son told me that uh, let's not take the flight. I will drive. So I just could not believe it and I said you first ask your dad. The dad also said yes and that was the most hilarious experience of my life that uh, the, we had uh, the ride up to Kerala from Mumbai. <laughs> 
great ma'am and like there are, are you are an uh, you are an author but yourself. why why it was exhilarating you know because yeah. i am uh, he was driving at a speed of 175 yet oh i we could God. not come and twice the at the uh, naka that uh, gentleman he extracted money from us because uh, oh, and we had a very great time uh, spending in uh, this so like that that makes sense when you said that it, it has a lasting impact on you because like 175 180 is like something very very and he didn't even come to know he was like that much. okay <laughs> then then you love speed it should be inferred that you loved speed and like you really enjoyed that when i'm on holiday i love everything <laughs> <laughs> great ma'am like holiday is something which is like i i don't think like and then would be like few people very exceptional people who would not love to travel and spend some time on a holiday or something but yeah uh ma'am you are an author yourself so are there any books movies or podcasts that you really like has any significant uh, influence on you recently because it is an era of podcasts specifically like mentioning books we are mentioning books and uh, movies but pod it is an era of podcasts so how do you like feel about it i say whatever has been recommended by my children on netflix i see but yes i like uh, like that raw movies you know that uh, the spy movies and yeah. uh, and uh, the patriotism movies hmm. i like that and my books books so don't have time and whichever books i read is mostly law books <laughs> <laughs> okay uh what values or principles do you prioritize in your interaction with your colleagues and clients honesty that's it okay oh, yeah. and uh, who are some Don't of the pretend nothing be what you are that's it take it or leave it yeah uh and honesty like is the is... best policy Yes, ma'am. That is exactly what I was going to say. Like, honesty is the best policy, and take it or leave it is the most honest approach that that you can have towards any person and towards your principles and your values. I am what I am. If you can get along with me, get along. Otherwise, there is no force. <laughs> Definitely, ma'am. Um, ma'am. who are some of the individuals if we ask that may have been influential uh, impact on you for shaping your personal and professional journey if we may ask yes uh, first professional i had one professor mr venu gopal and i have learned a lot from him because i was a chartered accountant and he used to teach at the institute also and he was such a dedicated person that you know once in a cism lecture that i was attending at the isaka uh, he started uh, at 5 and he ended at 1 o'clock in the night and uh, i was about to get up and go but basically he knew me from ci institute so he said preeti don't leave i'll reach you home so such was the dedication that on a particular topic you are supposed to isaka wants you to speak for 3 hours but you go on so so many hours is nothing but sheer passion on his part and we learned such a lot from him that he is unfortunately covid has taken him away from us but yeah i'm so sorry and the second on a personal front my mother then you will ask me who was she she was nobody she was a housewife okay she was a ba with philosophy and economics at that time but she chose to take care of us and not only that she was a step mother but nobody could make out that you know we i had a step sister like the she brought that person up as if it was her own 
like no neighbors also could not make out so you see this was the uh, highest value you can say that i found in my own house so i anyway mother's mother's position in life is the highest but then her qualities also was such you know that the more i observed her the more i felt you know uh, a fan of hers so i think my mother was a main inspiration for me uh ma'am you said like uh, i would disagree on the point that she was nobody but she was everything uh, a housewife she was nobody means she was not a doctor she was not a... no i'm housewife is like the biggest professional that we can have because correct but we all don't cannot exist consider that that way right people yeah, don't it's, consider it's, it's sad it's sad but the reality is that like uh, we cannot exist without them so my mother is also a housewife and i know that i cannot sit here in front of you and talk to you if she she is not there in the back with me so yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh ma'am how do you uh, uh stay con uh, stay connected to, with your friends and loved ones uh, with all the work I, i know you say you are always available you mentioned no no not that way i say um, that it is uh, not but, important yes ma'am how uh, many times you meet okay it is not important how many times you meet but it is important that when you meet how do you meet yes yes agar main if i say that i am all idealistic and i meet every day every time and i every month i call up all my friends i would be a liar but when i meet them for chance also there was once i met an old friend at the airport in coimbatore <laughs> but then how you meet like you know that yeah. is important when i go to grand thornton even the partners would come and just uh, give me a big hug you know so that is what i mean to say that how you meet that is important. definitely ma'am because we have we have so much of busy life that maintaining a healthy work life balance taking your family and friends with you and keeping them beside you all the time even when you are working and not I'm not there. possible yeah not possible. yeah exactly ma'am um okay ma'am and like what aspirations or goals do you have for your yourself uh, out of your professional career you have like achieved a lot but what are you like aiming on in the next coming years yes i have one more book that i'm in contemplating dedicating it to my mother okay, okay? okay. um uh, a gift called life oh. and that would not be a uh, theoretical book it would be based on experiences to you know i want the youngsters who commit suicide you know at a very young age to reason it out with them that life is very beautiful and give it a second thought and a second chance a very important one ma'am because yes ma'am it is very important you like Because all I've the seen people. many i have seen many of them so i it had inspired me and i want to finish that book and uh, we, me and my audience our audience is like definitely looking forward to it because it is a very real time issue presently so yeah uh uh last question for the round ma'am uh uh if we were to ask you to describe yourself in a word how it would be describe myself simple <laughs> i'm approachable anybody i'm sim- i could say that i want to be simple that's it great ma'am uh, simple and beautiful and yeah approachable for sure um, that is it for the personal round questions as well ma'am uh, we are to towards our the last round which is the rapid fire round uh, i would be like asking you very quick questions you just have to be like 
or you also have to be very quick and answer it like in one word or a sentence like how and like we are try, trying to just make it fun for the like this has been a very insightful and serious conversation um so let's get started uh my first would be tea or coffee tea <laughs> okay uh favorite cuisine ddll what that does mean exactly दिल वाले जाएंगे uh dogs or cats dog fiction or non fiction fiction favorite holiday destination switzerland a uh, one okay a uh, city life or countryside life city life introvert or extrovert extrovert <laughs> that is it ma'am for today's conversation thank you so much uh, for giving out your valuable time and sharing like so much of uh, valuable insights for us it has been a very wonderful and overwhelming experience and i hope you enjoyed this as much as we enjoyed having you on the i show. did um i again thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule and uh, taking this session with us me our team and our audience has been like uh, very are very much obliged uh, for you to taking the time out of your hefty schedule uh, like we know how much is there in your plate so thank you so much uh Yes, ma'am. And uh, for our audience, please stay tuned uh, to watch this and many other interesting conversations on our YouTube channel, uh, the Coffee Conversation Show. Please like, share, and subscribe to the channel. And uh, also do look forward to yet another interesting conversation with yet another guest. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Uh, thank you, ma'am. once again uh, for joining and we had a very wonderful time with you thank you so much same here same here